There's a story that's told by uh, Ron Lee Davis. He's a pastor. It's about one of his church members, um, and it really kind of helped shift his thinking a little bit about his focus on what he does there at the church. And so he talks about this young kid named David Kraft. And David Kraft was this big, strong kid, all muscle. At the time of 32 of age, he was six feet two, 220, I think he said. And he weighed about, you know, he, he was a big, solid muscle guy. He went to seminary. He ended up actually working with FCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, because, you know, he was this athletic kind of guy. Well, he was eventually diagnosed with cancer, right? It wrecked his body, and over a period of time, he went from 220 down to 80 pounds. And when he was about ready to pass from this life into the next, he asked his father to come into his hospital room, and he was lying there in his bed, and he looked up at his dad, and he said, Dad, do you remember when I was a little boy, how you used to hold me in your arms close to your chest? Of course, dad's like, well, of course I do. And then David said, do you think, Dad, that you could do that one more time, one last time? So again, his father nodded. He bent down to pick up his 32-year-old, 6-foot, 2-inch, 80-pound son, and he held him close to his chest so that his face was right next to his dad's face. They were eyeball to eyeball, tears streaming down both, both faces. And the son said to his father, thank you for building the kind of character into my life that can enable me to even face a moment like this. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for the gift of fatherhood. You are the father of all, and so we give you thanks. As you teach us what it looks like to be a loving, caring, compassionate father to us all, help us to become more like you in our journey to raise our kids and our grandkids. Open our hearts and our minds this day to receive your Holy Spirit as we worship and celebrate the Father who sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, to us the one who lived and died and rose again. Amen. All right, so guys, if you couldn't tell, today's going to be more about us than anyone. Happy Father's Day. And I know I run the risk of alienating some of you who may not have kids yet or don't even like kids uh, (laughs) or are still a kid yourself. But the text before us today is really about kids and their fathers and how loud they are. It's awesome. I'm just kidding, Owen. You're good. You're hanging there, buddy. Um, But even if you're not a father or dad, or maybe you think this isn't going to be about you today, just hang in there. You might glean something out of this message today. Ladies, don't get too upset if this isn't about you either, right? Because if you're here with your husband or your spouse or, or, you know, your brother, whoever it is, you'll have plenty of time after this message to say, didn't you hear what Pastor Jay said about how you're supposed to act toward our kids, right? So get something out of this too. You'll, You'll be fine. But on this Father's Day, if you are a father or a grandfather or a great-grandfather or a father-to-be, or if you are living the role of a father as well for someone, even if you can't wait to be a father, we look to the Word of God as ways to guide us in fatherhood, right? As a foundation for what our Lord says and how we're to act and to what our home could look like when it's a home that follows the Lord. All right, so most of us have heard, though, that LifeWay version of Joshua 24, 15, all right? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How many of you have that on a plaque or on your refrigerator, or you just really love that one and it's stuck in your head because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, right? It's a great, catchy little piece. Um, But it's really deeper than just that one verse, Um, I love it. But the context of this is in the context of a renewed covenant with God that Joshua is leading his people to. So Joshua, Old Testament or New Testament? Old, very good. Some of you are good. Uh, Joshua 24, this is where we find this. Joshua is now retelling to all the Israelite people the story of Abraham. He's rehashing it, letting them know that God led Abraham, and this is what happened to him. Then he transitions into what God did for people and Moses, which is a little more contemporary for him because he followed Moses. But all this is about God leading. And now he's at the point where he's like, God is leading us. God is leading me, Joshua. And he's calling them back because they were straying away as God's people always do. And he was telling the tribes of Israel after they all came together that they have got to make some changes, right? We've got to start doing some things differently. And so that's when we hear verses 14 and 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him all, with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. 
and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And this is when he says that line that we all know and love. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So there's a challenge there before he gets to that one little catchy phrase. And as we're reflecting, David Kraft, that first story I shared, he chose to serve the Lord. His dad chose to serve the Lord. And his life bore that fruit, right? He wasn't prepared for his son to die at 32, but he was prepared to know that he will see him again because of his faith in his God. And so today is just another reminder that we too have a choice. We have a choice. But if, seeing, if, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose this day whom you will serve. But if you choose God, then your home, your life, your spouse, your children must reflect that choice. And so we could all do with a little bit of growth in that area, I'm sure. A little bit of home improvement in our service for following the Lord. Y'all remember that series, the TV series, Home Improvement? Yeah, that one? Good, we got a little one. I'm not ashamed at all to say I truly enjoyed that one in particular. All right? Um, it was still a fairly wholesome sitcom. It dealt with modern-day topics and situations, but was a really cute show. All right? Tim the Tool Man Taylor, there we go, trying to be that man's man for everyone. He would have fit in pretty well to that video we just saw earlier, dropping all the dad jokes. Um, and for a while, and all you guys have to admit this, all right, we already, we, we've got confession coming up here too. So all of you probably at one time or another did the whole, arr, 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 right? Yes, you did. All right, that's fine. All right. But that was a show that was actually focused around an actual TV show sitcom. It was a sitcom inside of a sitcom, uh, but it dealt with home improvement, right? I love a good uh, wake up and, and smell uh, Home Depot in the morning. <laughs> but one of those things that we're going to talk about today is not the physical house that we're building that Tim the Toolman wants to help you fix up, right? But that the eternal house that we're looking in, that we alluded to earlier, that we're building for our kids and our grandkids and this next generation as we keep growing and growing. So we're going to look at Psalm 127 just as a baseline. And that's why we read Psalm, uh, verse 1 earlier. But we'll read that again and then we'll read the other uh, four verses that go with it. Psalm 127.1. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for good food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. And then he gets into verse 3. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Now, Psalm 127 and 128 kind of are, are a package deal. They work together. Um, they were both written by the same guy, or at least alluded to written by the same guy. And that same guy was King Solomon, all right? King Solomon is King David's son, but he was a king. Perhaps the wisest king, as we know, and the most wealthy king of all of Israel, and he understood family. That's why we read about blessed is the man whose quiver is full of children, right? Now, why do we know that he knew his way around the family life? Because Solomon had 700 wives, right? <laughs> Most of you guys are going, what? Right? One is plenty for us, right? For each one of us, guys. This is the part where you nod and say, yes, I have the perfect wife. I only need one. This is what we're going to do. Thank you, honey. All that good stuff, right? We don't need another 699 wives because we have the best ones out there, don't we? All right. But I'm thinking if he had 700 wives, he knew a little thing about marriage, maybe, but he definitely probably knew a little thing about kids, right? Now, I know Abraham was called the father of many nations, but this guy more than likely has, has quite a few kids running around as well. But here's the context of the psalm, why we bring this up. The psalmist is speaking in what's called the Near East culture. So it's a Near East ancient culture. And this culture that was uh, from the Oriental culture and primarily was generally male-centered, right? A lot of the first century cultures, all those before, male-dominated cultures. 
And what, what made this one dis- different is the fertility aspect. So the fertility of your wife and the gift of many children was actually a status symbol, right? So this makes sense why Solomon had 700 wives and lots of kids. He was revered then at this highest level of stature. Kids were a blessing, right? Now, we don't live in the same culture, but how does it still speak to us? We're definitely in a less male-dominated culture, and a woman's fertility, praise God, is not the measure of her success. But from those marriages, this is what we have. But this is all the word of the Lord, so we're going to keep going. The, it actually, this culture assumes marriage is a part of this day-to-day thing as well. Marriage and children are the norm for, and of course, in a lot of cultures still today, marriage and children is the norm. But they're all regarded as a blessing from God. Marriage, but specifically the children, all right? Children are a blessing from God. Now, we could dive really deep into the waters here, but we're going to stay surface level just for a little bit because most of us here today probably do value our kids as a blessing. We may not always like them, but they're still a blessing, aren't they? I have six, as you could tell. I had the shirt on, the dad shirt, right? Um, Three biological kids, three adopted kids. All of them are an absolute blessing from God. I can think of them in no other way than a blessing because primarily my wife and I are also grounded in the Lord. We understand that who it is that gave them to us. But we are surrounded by a culture that is growing more and more about a culture of children being a nuisance, right? They're not following God the way we used to. And so our children are actually being treated differently. The blessing part has shifted dramatically. So this view of children has really changed. And we're seeing the fruit of this culture shift on the news every week. But if we simply went back, and it has to start with us, if it simply went back to the idea that we are blessed by our children, then we might fight a little bit harder for them. But even this is bigger than what we might like. The idea of loving kids obviously is a great thing. It would be a remarkable improvement if we all just started doing that. But any change begins with God. And so our homes would look dramatically different if we took that verse 1 to heart. Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers, and folks, that's you and I, right? We are the laborers in this. Unless we're letting the Lord lead our houses, our homes, and we choose for ourselves to follow the Lord, if that doesn't happen, then our houses will continue to bear the fruit of the culture. And our children will continue to struggle to be a blessing. And it isn't easy. I get it. But if we aren't even trying, it's going to continue to be in vain. Psalm 128, I alluded to, also part of this. It actually tells us and looks what it looks like then when our houses are aligned with God, with the Spirit of God. Psalm 28 says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. Now, also keep in mind the culture it's speaking to. So there's a lot of those allusions to wife and children. But at the same time, dads, grandpas, men, this isn't just about us, but it is most definitely about us. We are to take the lead. And I'm not talking about the male power and control thing. That's not what we're talking about. Living as godly men, we have to lead. We are called to live into our maleness, if you will. And our maleness is created in the image of God. And as such, we are called then to live a life worthy of God's fruit. Numerous times in the Bible, just Google it. Passages about dads, right? Numerous times we are called to task, to lead our homes in the way of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9 comes to mind. These are the words that I command to you today. They shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. But pastor... Life is busy. I don't have time to talk to my kids about my faith. I'm doing well just to get them a bath once a week. Pastor, I don't have the knowledge of the Bible. 
that you do, which is why we at least bring them to the church once a month, right? I get it. I really do. I wasn't always a pastor. But guys, we are seeing the fruit of the excuses that we're throwing out there in the lives of our kids. And we aren't seeing the fruit of the fear of the Lord. And I say we because I'm not excluded here. None of us are. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, it will show in your life. Choose for yourself whom you will serve. Those words are ringing truer now more than ever. So I think we could all use a little bit more home improvement. The hard part is, where does the home improvement start? It starts with us. We have to look at our own walk first. Before we begin to play the blame game of culture or our parents or whatever else we want to throw at them, we have to take a hard look at ourselves and say, am I walking with the Lord? Who in my life is a priority? Whose house am I going to serve? Then you can read verses like Proverbs 27. The righteous who walks in his integrity, blessed are his children after him. What does it mean to be a righteous man in today's world? Well, we know we can't get there on our own, of course. But how do we walk in righteousness? It's following the Lord. It's doing everything for him. It's letting him lead. Understanding that when we let God lead with our lives, with our actions, we will have the full understanding that we can't do it on our own. It's too hard. Too much confusion. If we can only hope to attain any form of righteousness, it's through Jesus Christ. It's because of the one who went to the cross for us, died for us, and rose for us. The one who died the death that we deserve took that death away. So that when our lives are lived for the Lord, only then can we begin to grasp the hope that God has for us. But friends, you know that if our lives are not rooted in a relationship with Jesus Christ, we will have confusion. And then the fruit of our lives will also not look any different than the fruit of the city that we're trying to protect. If we're leading our lives in the Lord, it's a game changer. The book of 3 John, the first chapter, it reads, I have no greater joy than to hear my that my children are walking in the truth. That is one of my favorite verses now. How much joy do we have in our lives because of our kids walking in truth? Now, our kids aren't perfect. We know that. But man, have you ever had that moment? And I know I've talked to a few of you, so you have. That your kids will show, share with you about some time when they were scared, right? Sometimes where something was just really frightening, but they knew Jesus was with them, and so they weren't as frightened. Guys, that's the joy. There's no greater joy than that. Or the best one, <laughs> this one happens to me a lot, when we're, we're teaching your kids to pray and to give thanks before every meal, right? And then be, they call you out because you take a bite before we've said the prayer, right? <laughs> it's annoying, but they're good, they're right. They're just doing what we are teaching them. And that's joyful because they're beginning to grasp the enormity of giving thanks to a God for providing for them, even if it's just food. Stop and give thanks first. And kids learn and they watch. They absorb all that we are giving them. And if all we're giving them is an hour of worship a week and we think that's gonna do it, we have some home improvement to do. These children that God gives to us are a gift from him. They are actually his kids. It's a unique perspective to have. Yeah, I know, moms, you gave birth to them. God bless you for that. We'll never know what that feels like. But these are God's kids. He lends them to us for a brief period of time, however long that is. But they are a gift, as is everything else. A very precious gift, as we hear in the Bible. And you and I are going to be accountable for what we do with that gift. So who are you going to serve? I think that's why the, the psalmist finishes with verse, verses 4 and 5. He reads, Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. We get this image of an archer, right? Quiver full of arrows, even though they're little kids, so you pull them out leg by leg. But when their archers are trained... They practice. Archery is all about practice, consistency. 
So their hope is that when they fire these arrows, each one will go, number one, straight, that it'll stay on target, and number two, that it's going to hit the bullseye. That's the name of the game. Right in the center of the target. And that's basically it. But it's harder than we think. And yet, this is what we want for our children, don't we? We want them to walk on the straight and the narrow path. We want them to be successful, to hit that bullseye, to set up a target and succeed. Where are we aiming them? Are we aiming them at the world's standards? Or are we aiming them at God's standards? Where are we aiming our own lives? But don't we want our kids to land in the center of God's will? That may mean that they're wealthy or popular, or maybe they won't be. It doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is they become everything that God wants them to be and that they live right in the center of his perfect will. How could any of us ask for anything more than that? If it's important, what are we doing to help them get there? Whose house are we giving them? God's house? Or the world's house. And so that's why we gather together. It's why we have youth and family ministries. We're here to support you dads, if you will, in this walk. Because it isn't easy. We're here to do this together as a worship community. Because there are arrows that are slung every hour of every day. They're looking for someone and something to hit. But remember, arrows have to be aimed and then released. So give them the direction. Give them direction and then let them go. An arrow is not effective if it's not fired. And arrows that are left in the quiver or fired without any direction are not very good for anything. The shooter has to know, though, the target before he can hit it. He has to practice to get it right, has to be taught the correct ways. You're going to miss, but dads, you got to take the shot. you got to point them to Jesus. Help your child first before anything else, before sports, before school, before anything else. you got to take your shot and point them to Jesus. You have to give them the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is in their life. Early, 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 early. Share your faith with them while they're young so that when they do eventually leave home, they're going to have a solid foundation But you also have to know who Jesus is in your life to help point them there. Because when the time does come to let them go, and you do have to let them go, unless they're like me and you keep adopting kids and you never let them go. Reads are laughing, right? They got to know their target. Dedicate those kids to God. See them as a blessing in your life, and it changes your perspective. Teach them. Invest in them. Be vulnerable with them. Turn them over to God. Love them, show them grace, show them forgiveness. Be Christ to them as you point them to the ultimate target, Jesus Christ. Because when you do, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and pray. God, thank you for the gift of children. Thank you for the gift of parenthood. There are so many things that we could do Maybe we should do a little bit differently in our lives. Help us to find the strength and the courage to make that U-turn, to serve you in our house and not the world. It may be contrary to everything we've done thus far, but I think that's the point. You did everything different than we did, and you call us to live in that way. So help us to rally around one another to become family to each other, to help raise our kids in the way of the Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. To give my heart, you my life.